In the next few slides, I'll be introducing main concepts relating to psychoanalytic criticism, which is the use of some techniques of psychoanalysis to interpret works of literature. I'm here focusing on Freud and Lacan's theories as introduced in Peter Barry's book, Beginning Theory. Sigmund Freud is an Austrian neurologist and psychoanalyst who lived in the late 19th century to the early 20th. And in spite of some strong criticism on how he developed his theory of the unconscious, he remains a major force in how we think about ourselves and how we interpret literature. In his earlier work, Freud saw the psyche to be split between two parts, the conscious or that which we are aware of and the unconscious or that which is hidden from us. In his later work, he developed this further into a three-part psyche made of the ego or the consciousness, the awareness, the superego, which is the conscience or our internal moral police force, and the id, which is the unconscious. It is in the unconscious where Freud developed his theory on repression, where those desires, conflicts, and traumas we do not wish to face are pushed into the unconscious or repressed, and his theory of sublimation, where those things we hide take on a greater substance or a greater importance or a greater size. Other key terms when it comes to Freud and psychoanalysis are those he referred to as defense mechanisms that we employ to avoid pain. These include transference of our emotions for one person into another, very typical in a patient transferring their hatred or love of the father or the mother to a hatred of their therapists. This includes also projection, the projection of our personal feelings, characteristics, viewpoints into another, such as feeling frightened and asking the friend sitting next to you if they are scared. A third mechanism is screen memory, which refers to how we push away significant memories and replace them with trivial ones, like trying to remember a painful scene but all that comes to the mind is the background music or the color of the dress rather than the pain or, or the pain associated with the, scene, with the scene itself or what caused the pain or the painful scene. And finally, Freud and slips as also a defense mechanisms, a mechanism where we say something we don't think we mean, but it could actually hide real feelings that we don't want to express. As simple as telling someone to open the fridge when you want to tell them to open the book because you're hungry and you don't want to face your hunger for whatever reason and it slips the word fridge slips when what you really intend to say is book freudian interpretation of dreams is especially significant to readers of literature as the techniques used by freud are the same ones we use to analyze a work of literature among these techniques is displacement where one thing or one event is represented by another so a flag is used to represent a country Hospital is used to represent the sick, and so on. And condensation, where a number of events or a group of people are condensed in one image in the work of literature. So um, a big quarrel you had with your friends is represented by an image of one friend or even one other person. There are many ways of using Freud's theories to analyze works of literature. Among them is looking for the overt meaning of the work of literature which represents the conscious or obvious one, the obvious meaning, and compare it to, the, to its covert or unconscious me meaning. Freudian, Freudian critics also focus on the unconscious of the author or of the character and study the motivations behind their actions. They look for sexual intonations, especially as they pertain to the infantile stages of character's development and they generally highlight the psychic context of a text over its social or historical one. One example of psychoanalytic criticism is looking into the reason Hamlet delays murdering his uncle as a revenge for his uncle killing his father and marrying his mother. And a psychoanalytic, a psychoanalytic critic would attribute this delay to, to a hidden unconscious desire of Hamlet himself to replace his uncle and marry his mother. So it becomes difficult for him to kill someone who represented his desires or who made his desires come true. The second prominent name linked to psychoanalytic criticism is Jacques Lacan. He's a 20th century French psychoanalyst whose work focuses on language 
influenced by Saussure and Jacobson. The influence of, la of language is mostly seen in Lacan's lecture of 1957 called The Insistence of the Letter. In this lecture, he states that the unconscious is structured like a language. Deriving from Saussure's study of the language, Lacan reiterates here that although the sign is made of um, signifier and signified, the meaning of words is not linked to their signified, as the relation is, is arbitrary, of course, but is in their relation to other words and their difference or similarity to these other words. He compares two literary tropes that Jacobson discusses, which are um, metaphor and metonymy. He says that metaphor has the same functions and structure as condensation, where different items are condensed into one image, and that metonymy is similar to displacement, where one term replaces another. In a similar manner to how Freud linked our actions to our childhood, in the case of Freud, of course, that the focus was on the sexual development of, of uh, the child. Lacan, because of his interest in language, also looks at the development of our consciousness as we move from children into adults to elaborate on the significance of each of these stages of development. Lacan argues that there is a stage before our consciousness is developed, which he refers to as the imaginary, when the child identifies himself or herself as part of the mother with no distinction between self, child, and mother, or and other. Self and other are one. At around the age of six to 18 months, the child enters what Lacan terms the mirror stage, where the child sees his own reflection in the mirror or in other people's eyes and starts developing a sense of themselves as separate from the world, separate from, the, from their mother. It is through this that the child then enters into the language system, which Lacan termed the symbolic stage, where societal norms begin to affect the child, forcing its inhibitions and restrictions, referred to by Lacan as the rule of the father. Lack and separation are prominent functions here, since language refers to that which is not present, that which we lack or that which we desire. And since entry into society pushes certain elements of our psyche into the unconscious, so we lack them. They become something that is hidden. Within this framework, Lacanian psychoanalytic critics can look at the text to uncover its hidden meanings, much like what is done in deconstruction. Or they can look at one of the phases Lacan used to describe the development of the unconscious to find instances where the characters are exhibiting patterns pertaining, for example, to the mirror stage. They can look at elements of lack and desire as also part of this development, but to the framework of the text itself and how a character's lack motivates their action, mostly from the unconscious point. And finally, they can look at how texts can demonstrate tenets of Lacanian criticism itself, so texts that are more imaginative and less realistic are significant here. As an example, Edgar Allan Poe's The Purloined Letter is seen from a Lacanian perspective where the letter is related to the unconscious affecting people's actions without them knowing its content because the letter here is hidden, much like the unconscious. The investigation itself functions like a therapy session where therapists guide patients to repetitions of events that enables the verbalization of what's hidden, much like the repetition of, of the theft leads to unraveling how it happened. Finally, of course, the story itself provides an endless play of signifiers and referrals, much like the nature of language itself, which is referential.